Hi everybody, I'm Jared Pike. This is Shell Point Today for the weekend of December 6th, 7th, and 8th. On today's show, we hear the story of George Chun, a Hawaii resident who witnessed the Pearl Harbor invasion and later enlisted to fight in Korea. But first, we want to make sure you know about two big shopping opportunities. The outdoor Shell Point Marketplace will have all sorts of special goodies from 17 different vendors, from the usual flowers and vegetables to homemade soaps, perfumes, crafts, and much more, perfect for gift giving. We'll even have Christmas caroling. The extended marketplace happens Friday morning from 8.30 to 11.30 in the island's administration courtyard. And at the community thrift store, they're serving up snacks, as well as your chance at special savings and deals for one day only. It's the whole, whole, whole lot of savings at the community thrift store, open extended hours Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The community thrift store is located on the corner of McGregor and Gladiolus, next to Planet Fitness. Friday also features the resident quarterly meeting. Now, if you want to be in the know about all things Shell Point, then hear the information straight from the source, President Peter Dice. Bring your questions to the resident quarterly meeting Friday at 2.45 p.m. in the church auditorium. And if you miss it, don't worry. We're rebroadcasting it all next week on Shell Point TV, Channel 13. Now, the Christmas spirit keeps on rolling on Sunday with the Village Church Christmas Celebration, featuring a full choir and festival orchestra. That Season of Praise concert happens Sunday night at 6.15 p.m. And then Monday night, another holiday concert, this one featuring jazz and stuff, tone chimes, the rollicking recorderists, and even some narration from our own David Hallenstein. The Holiday Sounds concert takes place Monday night at 7.15 p.m. in the church auditorium. Now, this weekend is also notable for another reason. Saturday is December 7th. Now, for many of you, it's a date which will live in infamy. That's how President Roosevelt referred to the attacks on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Now, because that was more than 70 years ago, we don't have many living eyewitnesses to the event, but there is at least one who lives right here at Shell Point. George Chun of Solana grew up on the island of Oahu and was nine years old when he saw Japanese planes fly over his house on their way to Pearl Harbor. Last year, George shared his story with members of the Shell Point Veterans Club and also described how his relationship with the Japanese evolved after he himself joined the service. And one Sunday morning, we saw all these planes coming by. And Wheeler Field had a great big black column of smoke coming up there. And we could see the Japanese plane, but we didn't know it was Japanese. We could see the bombs falling and planes whizzing around us. And after a while, we could see little ack ack action, you know, the puffs of smoke in the air. And we thought, what a show they're putting on for us. <laughs> and the planes were flying, flying pretty low. And we waved at the airplanes. And they, little did we know that they were firing at us and dropping incendiary bombs. And all this confusion was going on. We didn't, had no idea it was war. We were afraid of invasion. There were rumors that the islands were being invaded and the west coast was taken and all this and that and the other. And we didn't know what to do. My mother suggested maybe we run up and hide in the mountains, but we didn't have any provisions for camping or anything. And so it was a scary time. We started digging air raid shelters and this, that, and the other. Food was hard to get. Schools were closed. We wondered when we were going to be invaded. And so it was a scary time. There were eight, eight boys in the family, and five of us served 
in the military. And not only served in the military, but during the war, three of them worked at Pearl Harbor, repairing ships and things. It was during the Korean War, and I got shipped, of all places, to Yokohama. And it was peaceful. I worked with the Japanese people, and one of them was a kamikaze pilot that didn't... The war was over just before he was called up to fly his airplane. He was a nice fella, and he gave me a, a gift. <laughs> it was a lacquered bowl. Oh. I worked in a Japanese Baptist church near Yokosuka in Tokyo Bay, and <clears throat> for my farewell party, <laughs> With the young people, there are about 25, 20, 25, I don't know. I don't remember how many. But they, they stood up and said, Banzai, Banzai, Banzai. <laughs> Things change. Coming up, we are replaying some of the week's best stories from Shell Point TV. But before we do that, Let's cover all of this weekend's happenings, menus, and church news. It's Friday, everyone, and my name's Leslie Brand, and I'm here with Mary Franklin. And just to let you know, the holiday activities don't stop. We're here to tell you for the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, about the activities and holiday celebrations that are going on. We're going to start out at 815, Stamp Ministry in the Stamp Room on the island. Now it's time for everyone to make their way out to the administration courtyard at 8.30 for the start of our holiday marketplace. Not only can you get your veggies, but also a huge variety and selection of Christmas gifts this year. It goes until 11.30 and we'll also be having carolers, so you'll enjoy nice Christmas music to get you in the spirit. And then at 9 o'clock, we have the ho, 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 lots of savings at the community thrift store this year. It goes until 5 o'clock, so make sure you stop there and get some additional Christmas gifts. Wow, you'll really knock out some shopping today. And then at 9 o'clock also, it's the men's match play doubles tennis at the tennis courts at the Woodlands. 9.30 is the Suzy Q, downtown Fort Myers for lunch. Sign up is required. 10 o'clock is Canasta at the Game Room at the Woodlands. Inquiring Minds is going to be in the Manatee Room at 10.15. And at 12.30 is the Mixed Progressive Bridge in the Game Room. Don't miss the Diabetes Group in the Social Center at 1 o'clock. Then at Table Tennis at 1.15 in the Tarpon Room. Also at 1.15 we have the Quilters in the Osprey Room on the island. Great Decisions in Africa at 1.30. It's in the Manatee Room on the island. Model Train Room at 1.30 to 3.30 in the Train Room on the island. Don't Miss Euchre at 2 o'clock in the Sable Room at the Woodlands. 2.45, we have the Resident Quarterly Meeting at the Church Auditorium on the island. And at 6.45, we'll end the day with game night in the Resident Activity Center. Take it away, Mary, to tell everyone about Saturday activities. Thank you, Leslie. At 8 a.m., Round Robin Men's Doubles Tennis will take place. And that takes us to 9.30 when the Women's Doubles will be played. 9.45, Duplicate Bridge will be played in the Manatee Room on the island. And at 10.15, the Model Yacht Sailing Club will be sailing in the Garden Apartment Pond on the island. And then at 1 o'clock, chess will be played in the Library Lounge of the Resident Activity Center. And table tennis will be played in the Tarpon Room at 1.15. Head down to the Health Club on the island at 3.15 for basic line dancing. And at 6.30, Duplicate Bridge will be played in the Manatee Room on the island. Please arrive by 6.15. Leslie, what happens on Sunday? We have more celebrations. We do, and it starts at 9 o'clock at the Christian Life Studies in the Game Room at the Woodlands. 9.15 is also another Christian Life Studies at the Village Church. 
10.15, we have morning worship at the Village Church on the Island, broadcasted live on Shell Point TV Channel 12. 1.30 was the Mixed Golf League at the Shell Point Golf Club. And we're going to end the day with Season of Praise at 6.15. It's a Christmas celebration at the Village Church. Thank you for tuning in with us, and we hope you have a great week, and it's packed full of activity, so go out and make sure you don't miss any of them. Menus for your weekend. In the Crystal Room, the Crystal Platter on Friday is crab cakes with dill, orzo, pilaf, and asparagus. The dinner special is the seafood buffet for $14.95, and the soup of the day is New England clam chowder. In the Island Cafe for lunch on Friday, enjoy a meatball sub with chips for $7.25, the dinner special is Chef's Choice for eight twenty-five, and the Palm Grill on Friday is closed for a private party. On Saturday, the Crystal Room is closed. In the Island Cafe for lunch on Saturday, enjoy a fish sandwich with coleslaw and fries for seven twenty-five. The dinner special is pumpkin pork with mashed potatoes and sautéed carrots for eight twenty-five. Dinner specials in the Palm Grill on Saturday are prime rib for nineteen ninety-five, or chicken fricassee for thirteen ninety-five. On Sunday, the Crystal Room features its Sunday brunch for seventeen fifty. In the Island Cafe for lunch on Sunday, the special is egg, bacon, and cheese on an English muffin with fresh fruit for seven twenty five. For dinner, the special is Chef's Choice for eight twenty five, and the Palm Grill is closed on Sundays. All menus are available twenty four hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Hi, Randy Woods, and I'm here today with Pastor Andy as we're well into the Christmas season, this being the second Sunday of Advent, and continuing in your series that for unto us a child is born. Mm -hmm. Tell us where we are looking at uh, this Sunday as we consider that text from Isaiah. Well, I'm excited uh, to be in this Advent season. Obviously, the first time I'm here in this church to do Advent, and so it's really an exciting proposition for me to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to, what a wonderful text to use, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and uh, and upon his shoulders the government will, will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Okay. And so the, his nature and character of this messianic passage is displayed in those names. Mm -hmm. And so we're focusing each of those Advent messages on uh, one of those pairs of names. And so uh, this time we'll be up to Mighty God. Okay. Which is kind of remarkable uh, because what happens is uh, this is a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't usually put a child together with a gut with God mm -hmm. and then mighty God and so you're really recognizing uh, something very very special about this child that to whose birth we celebrate this time of the year it's a great messianic passage and uh, one of those wonderful ones that display not only the humanity but also the divinity of Jesus mm -hmm. think of that mystery that God has shown himself to us mm -hmm. in a child and last week we heard Brad and Kathy Jackson speak of their experience. Mm -hmm. And so many others will share throughout this Advent season what we have learned from children. Mm -hmm. Because God speaks to us in many different ways. And certainly this Christmas season we're reminded of that. And as we celebrate Sunday morning with Advent and your message, we'll continue Sunday night. I invite folks to join us as tickets are available tonight. Join us on Sunday night for the Christmas celebration. It's going to be a wonderful time. Your wife is one of our soloists. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. She's my favorite soprano. Oh, yes. And uh, it's, a, it's also a delight first time for, for us to be here during uh, one of your Christmas presentations, and so it's exciting. It is. Well, we have enjoyed the opportunity in the past to work with the symphony. And again, this year, we have members of the Southwest Florida Symphony, the Naples Philharmonic, as well as Sarasota, local musicians, uh, freelance musicians who come together to form the festival orchestra. So we'll have that and the full choir. And it's just an exciting opportunity for us to celebrate God's goodness this Christmas season mm -hmm. through song. Absolutely. And speaking yeah. of song, you always do a great job of putting together songs that complement the theme of a service. And so uh, what's the choir going to be doing on Sunday morning, for instance? Well, Sunday morning we're doing that old carol entitled, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming, an Advent carol of the prophecy. So we'll be doing that as part of the musical on Sunday night as well. And we look forward to just sharing these wonderful carols of Christmas, some in a very traditional arrangement, others with some turns and twists with classical influences, particularly the Tchaikovsky Nutcracker uh, melodies will be shared. And I don't want to say too much, but you'll hear it 
Sunday yeah, night yeah. as we share together in celebration. Yeah, well, that's exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, we are too. We trust you'll be part of the worship services Sunday morning at 1015, Sunday night at 615. The morning service is broadcast live on Shell Point TV, Channel 12, and uh, invite you to get your tickets. There will be possibly some available at the door, but hopefully you've got your tickets by now and will join us as we celebrate this Advent season and Christmas blessing throughout the month of December. Have a wonderful weekend. It's time for our Shell Point TV Week in Review. And all this week, we featured stories about Shell Point pastors who continue their service even in retirement. First up is the story of Don Schneff. When I was in high school, I was sort of a goof off, if you can imagine that. And my, one of my teachers recommended that I quit school and go into the military. So I thought that was the best idea. I went home, my dad said, that's fine. So I quit and uh, joined the Navy. The day I was old enough to go in, I went in as a musician and spent four years in the Navy as a musician. Then I came out. As a matter of fact, I didn't go to church much till I was 23. That's when I came to Christ, I was 23. Well, we had a, a manufacturing, we had uh, a furniture store, and we did, uh, sold foam rubber, and I manufactured wetsuits for skin diving and water skiing. When I got saved at 23, we joined a small Baptist church near our house in Orlando, and uh, just through the ministry there, we felt the Lord calling us to go to Bible college to prepare for something. We didn't really know what. I didn't really think I was going to be a pastor. I was more interested in music or youth, something like that. But I uh, uh, ended up going back to the church I left. Went back as a youth pastor. And six months later, the pastor left. And then uh, they asked me to be the interim till they found somebody. And, and so I'd been doing the preaching then, and they wanted me to stay as the pastor. So I pastored there for 37 years. That was my first church. I'd never practiced baptism or Lord's Supper or wedding, anything like, you know, the preachers do. So I had a baptism coming up and this huge fellow, he was a U.S. Marshal. He was huge. And my wife says, you know, we bought a practice. I said, that's a good idea. She put on a shift, took off all of her clothes, put it over a chair and uh, put on a shift. And I took off my shirt and put on the waders. And uh, we got up, just got into the water. And there's a knock at the door. We're calling from George Stewart. Uh, office supply, we have some tables to deliver to your, to your church. He looked at me and O's shirt and the waiters and he looked over the chair and a woman's clothes laying over there. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm ba practicing baptism. I don't think he believed me, but anyway, that was that story. I have the gift of teaching and that's been the highlight of my ministry, uh, the focus of my ministry. I was what you call an expository preacher. I went verse by verse, book by book. And uh, so that's just what I did at that in my preaching and in my teaching in Sunday school. I also had Bible studies for the Minnesota Twins in Orlando when they would be uh, for their spring training. They had spring training at that time in Orlando. And uh, we had some of the Twins were members of our church. And uh, so through that we would have uh, navigator Bible studies with them and their wives. I remember one young lady, her mother and father started attending our church. And uh, when she came, she had piercings and, you know, uh, looked a little rough. But I accepted her as she was, and, and she uh, appreciated that and actually became one of the most active families in our church. They were there for everything. And they're still active uh, in another church now that I've left. We live in a pastorium right next to the church. And uh, just before we were getting ready to go to bed, some girl knocked on the door, and we opened the door, and she says, your church is on fire. And I looked over there, and sure enough, it was. And what had happened is that somebody had left a light on. They'd had a choir rehearsal uh, for the Easter cantata the night before, and somebody forgot to turn one of the lights off in the nursery, and the ballast uh, caught fire and burned the church down. So we had the Easter service under a big oak tree. We used to come here on vacation, and we'd stay at the guest house and meet people. Well, walking around the island one morning, I met a fella, uh, Harry Piles. And uh, I said, are you resident here? And he says, yes. I said, uh, we'd love to move in here, but I said, I don't know if we can afford it. I said, I'm a pastor. He says, well, I'm a pastor. I said, yeah, but I'm an independent Baptist pastor. He says, well, I'm an independent Baptist pastor. He didn't have much money and I didn't have much money and the Lord opened the way for us. Since I've been here, I have taught um, a crown course, which is a crown financial uh, course, teaching people how to get out of debt. I've taught that three times at Westminster Presbyterian Church. 
Uh, I've taught a, the adult Sunday school classes there, both the young adult and the senior adults. Well, I like the young adults because I've had a number of our young adults go off to Bible college and into ministry, you know, through the years. And then I taught at Hope um, Counseling. They have a course where you can become a certified counselor with the uh, American Association of Biblical Counselors. And I've taught that uh, on theology. I taught the, uh, the Trinity and the attributes of God. Well, I just really enjoy teaching the Word of God. I just like to see the light go on in people's lives, you know, and uh, they're following the Lord and obedient to the Lord and going on with Him. Yeah, that's exciting. See lives changed. We also talked to Emerson Ross, who, with at least a dozen different pastorates all over the country, was a true traveling man. My father was a pastor, so they uh, would sometimes tease me and say, oh, you'll be, you'll be a, another preacher. And I said, no, that's, that's not something I want to be. But it, I feel that the call of the Lord to uh, enter the ministry came when I was about 16. And it was a conviction that this is what the Lord wanted me to do. Went to Nyack College, which is on the Hudson, north of New York City. Uh, there I met my wife and uh, proceeded to get my training for uh, the ministry. The first church, of course, is a lot of work. You don't have any backlog to rely on, and uh, everything, every, it's a, everything is uh, fresh every week, you know. And in those days, a pastor did everything. It was Sunday morning, it was Sunday night, it was Wednesday night, and uh, running the mimeograph machine and all the other things that went with it. So you were, you were, you were doing everything in that church. It was a rural church in York County in Pennsylvania made up primarily of Pennsylvania Dutch people, farmers, and here I was, uh, 21 years of age, uh, being chairman of a board of uh, people that were old enough to be my grandparents, and I had never sat on a board. What 20-year-old ever sits on a board? And now suddenly I'm chairman of the board. <laughs> so that was quite a, quite a way to begin. I don't think you want to know about all of we were. We had 12 pastorates. Go, go ahead and run through them. Is that right? Here, Is that the right? List. Do the run. Well, after Osceola came uh, Milton, Delaware. I took a, about a 400, 500 mile trip south. And then we went to Wilmington, Delaware, northern uh, Delaware. And from there we went to Harrisburg. We were there around four years. From there we went to Connecticut, uh, Trumbull, Connecticut. After Trumbull, Connecticut, it was down to Washington, D.C. And then uh, Akron, Ohio. And from Akron, Ohio to Willoughby Hills, Cleveland. And then from there back to Pennsylvania again. We sort of made a circle and we were back to uh, in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And then after Lewisburg, uh, Manassas, Virginia. Manassas, I thought, was my last full-time pastorate. After that, we went into uh, interim ministries, uh, did 13 interims. They were like six months uh, that took us uh, up into uh, Massachusetts, uh, even over to Hawaii, where we served in Honolulu for about 10 months as an interim pastor. So they were all over the place. So there, were th there was 13 interim pastorates and 12 uh, regular pastorates. My last assignment was uh, in the villages. You've probably heard of the villages. Some men are maybe cut out more for uh, long-term ministries. My son-in-law is, a, is a, a pastor and he's been close to 20 years in one place. But uh, and I think if you are multi-talented and with, with many gifts, maybe you can uh, stay longer then uh, I, I felt that my, lim my gifts maybe were somewhat uh, limited and maybe in five or six years or so I pretty well gave my best to a congregation. The children once in a while would complain about changing schools, you know, and I remember one of my daughters saying, well, when I get married, I'm going to stay put. Well, she happened to marry a military man, which took her all over the place. I did one interim since being here. I went to uh, Sebring. Uh, traveled back and forth uh, each Sunday and went there for several months. And now I'm ministering at the Chinese church in, down in Naples the second Sunday of every month. I speak through an interpreter 
and uh, it's sometimes uh, I have to present a manuscript. I usually send it out the first of the week for the following Sunday. And uh, so you'll really have to reduce your, your material to about half of what you would normally give. It's a little different. And you have to pause after each uh, phrase or so, so she can interpret it. It's in your blood, it's a call of the Lord, and the, you know, the scriptures say the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, which means to me that if he's given you a gift, he, he wants you to use that as long as you physically are able to do that. There is a special camaraderie, I think, with, in any profession. The lawyers like to get together and, uh, you know, physicians like to get together, and I'm sure that's true of pastors we have. And many that I meet here uh, have not met for the first time. Many of them were in college with me. And so it's kind of like a reunion to, to live at Shell Point. You don't always see the fruit of your labor immediately. But uh, maybe years later, someone says, do you remember me? Uh, you picked me up for Sunday school and took me to church in Sunday school, Sunday after Sunday. And that hap has happened a number of times. Now the person has grown up and uh, is serving somewhere, is in some walk of life. And, uh, uh, and it's very rewarding, you know, very rewarding. At Shell Point, a group meets every Tuesday to discuss living healthy. The group is called Living Healthy. I'm Mary Franklin here today with Michelle Smith, the fitness supervisor, to talk about an exciting new program in the Health Connection starting on October 1st. It is titled Living Healthy. It's going to meet every Tuesday at 11.45 a.m. for 30 minutes in the Osprey Room. Michelle, what is Living Healthy all about? I'm very excited to offer this class, and the class is all about um, being active, living a healthy lifestyle, your overall wellness. So we're going to meet for about 30 minutes once a week, employees and residents together, to discuss our healthy living options, how we can increase possibly our exercise or decrease our caloric intake with meals, just topics that we want to learn more about. This is all about the class. And Shell Point decided since the residents were doing Life Quests, we have introduced Life Quests to all of our employees, and we thought this would be a great mutual program that everyone can go to and receive a lot of great information. Now, Michelle, you have had some past experience in this? Absolutely. I worked for five years at a leading um, weight loss and nutrition company, so I bring a lot of credibility and experience um, to the class that I'm very excited about. And you'll be teaching most of the classes, but you'll bring in some guest speakers as well. Cheryl, Mel, and Craig, our other fitness coordinators, will be joining me to present their specialty from time to time. So it's not always going to be me presenting the topic. I also um, ask for suggestions from residents and employees on what they're interested in too. Okay. And so this isn't so much as you're weighing in every week, it's more about checking in, getting tips, so that if your goal is to lose weight, this would be a great place to get some inspiration or just learning how to live well, correct? Correct, there will be no scale, no measuring, just a group setting where we can talk about health and exercise and fitness. Well, a lot of people have been asking for this program. We are excited to bring it to you. It will start on Tuesday, October 1st. It will run every Tuesday. No need to sign up, just come when you can in the Osprey Room at 11.45 a.m. I am Mary Franklin along with Michelle Smith. We hope you make it a happy and healthy day. Neil Clark is a pastor who enjoyed his college days with his touring gospel quartet so much, they reunited to record a new CD. I was a teenager, uh, made a commitment in my life at about uh, 15 or 16. Uh, to serve the Lord uh, any way He wanted me to. And over a period of years, uh, it became uh, plain to me that pastoral ministry was uh, where I was being led. I was uh, Dick Pease's roommate uh, in college, uh, participated in uh, his wedding with uh, Ellie and we traveled the country for a whole summer singing in churches and so forth. He was the piano player. At the piano, Dick Pease from Wellsville, New York. 
and I sang in the quartet. Neil Clark from White Plains, New York. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. We traveled in a 1952 Studebaker, and uh, so Dick and I had uh, a great many times together in that experience as well. Thirty some years later, the five of us, four guys and the pianist, we got together in uh, Toledo, Ohio and got in a professional studio and made a CD of all the stuff we used to sing from memory. And it's for sale at the uh, gift shop here at Shell Point. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. I went to uh, what was then Gordon Divinity School outside of Boston, which is now Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And uh, I graduated from there in 1960. And uh, my first pastorate was in Bennington, Vermont. And so I was already in New England going to the seminary and uh, wound up pastoring a church in New England and stayed there for a good long time. Then moved around a bit to New York State and back, actually back to Nyack where I pastored uh, the church near the campus of the college there. And then was called back to New England to serve as the district superintendent for that part of the country, for New England. And when that concluded, uh, I was in my 60s and not quite sure what the next step was. And I decided I needed a home base. And so that was, after that year, I formally retired and moved to Shell Point. And then I began a series of interim pastorates. Uh, my first one was in um, Champaign, Illinois. When the uh, call comes to help out in an interim pastorate, uh, I'm uh, usually ready to go. And right now, I'm helping out at the North Shore Alliance Church in North Fort Myers. They're without a pastor, and I'm going to be uh, assisting that congregation for, I'm not sure uh, how many months, but I just started a few weeks ago. She and I went to college together. We, we knew each other very, very casually. She happened to marry a good friend of mine, and uh, he was a pastor also in the Alliance. Uh, he passed away about six years ago. And uh, we bumped into each other a few years back. Uh, so for a year and a half we dated and no one knew. Uh, there were two people here in Shell Point who were uh, in my confidant and coaching me. <laughs> uh, but no one else knew. And we came very close to uh, uh, eloping without anybody knowing. But then we decided we would at least uh, let people know. So uh, we told a few people and then, but most people found out with an announcement after the wedding, which was in her living room as was really just a very small family affair. Retirement is certainly valid, uh, but when you have a sense of uh, God calling you into ministry and gifting you in some way to serve the body of Christ, um, that giftedness and that calling never goes away. And so you always want to be a benefit to the kingdom of God and my calling was pastoring, and so that's the best kind of contribution I can make. Every Wednesday, the scrapbooking group meets to assemble their memories in beautiful packages. Let's take a look. A scrapbook is a uh, combination of your photos and an ornamental way to display them in an acid-free book with acid-free products to save the photos forever. A photo album is what we used to do and now what we're doing is taking those photos so that they don't deteriorate over time and we're doing embellishments. We're adding things, we're creating the story and through the pictures and some of us are doing journaling and adding the stories so that in future generations they can not just see the picture, they get the, the big picture. You make your scrapbook for a purpose or for no purpose. I make mine for no purpose. I do a couple pages of whatever I want to do and put them all in one book. Most people pick a subject and they might do a grandchild and give that grandchild the book for their birthday. 
Uh, they might do their mom. They might do a funeral book for someone who just died and they bring it to the funeral. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Some of us are also combining it with genealogy. I've done books on all the family members, even great-grandchildren now. So it's creating memories, it's sharing, and leaving a life history. This is a book that I had made for my mom and dad for their 50th anniversary. And it was all just pictures in there. So I'm now taking the book apart and I'm making pages that are now uh, from the same book. If you want to do inexpensively, you can just get a folder like they have in school. And I made copies of our reunion. This is one that I did on one reunion. And I gave it to everybody. So it was very economical. And then this is another eight and a half by 11 photo. That was for my mom's funeral. And then I'm doing Christmas letters. And I have each year. This was done by my son when we went to NASA. And so most of it is just pictures, you know. So I need to improve on the fixing it up for a scrapbook instead of just having it in a notebook. Those are scissors that make very pretty little cuttings like this, cutting around pictures and things, and it just embellishes it so that it looks really, really nice, you know, so. And I'm, I'm very happy now that Kay decided to do this again because, you know, it's been a long time for me, but I'm enjoying it tremendously. I'm just sorting materials now for a scrapbook that I'm gonna make that ties in with the genealogy research I'm doing on my father's father. He came from Hungary in 19, 1904 and he went to work in the copper mines in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so what I'm doing today is just sorting through those materials to decide what I'm going to use. But I'm having a good time looking at this. It's just a, it's a wonderful hobby. Debbie has a completely different idea on scrapbooking with a lot of embellishments. And these are scrapbook pages she also did. It's not a class, but we are teaching while we're also doing our own projects. And everyone in here is willing to help someone. And she spoke about Mildred. Mildred had never done scrapbooking before. She was here three times. And both the first two times, she was everyone was telling her what to do, but she couldn't start. So she finally started, and now she's doing it at home. And she's amazing. She's teaching now. I had boxes and boxes and boxes of photos. So I thought, how long am I going to save these, and when can I ever look at them? So I decided, when I heard about this, I was going to come and learn. So I brought some pictures, and then I looked at what everybody was doing, but I was scared to do it myself. I thought, oh, I'll mess that up. I can't do it. I can't do it. Now, I started out with this one. This is a, just to see if I could do it. I learned from the girls here, you know, to how to make a page beautiful. And this is like the family tree that I learned from Doris. And so I had fun, and I do have fun, and I do it at home, and I, after I get up in the morning, I see what I have to do. <laughs> I just have fun doing it, and they think it's pretty good I learned after two classes. <laughs> we teach and learn. We're teachers, and we learn, and all these supplies all down there are all donated so everybody can help one another, and so we buddy up. I've learned a lot from them. I didn't know the corner cutter. I was doing it with the scissors all these years, and you can, there it is. She, uh, Joy showed me how to do it. I love it. But do another one. <laughs> yeah, they've been wonderful. She's been a joy to me. <laughs> well, this is a Christmas card I received last year, and I thought it was so adorable. I wanted to copy it and make a centerpiece for my table. So this is Fine Art 101, <laughs> you know. I've never tried anything like this before, but there's so much talent here. I'm getting so much help, but I'm loving it. I'm learning so much. I used to paint, and I painted my cards. And then one day, one of my friends that I painted with said, why don't you try card making? And I said, well, that's what I'm doing. 
And she said, no, she said, come with me. So I went and I got hooked. Cards are very similar to scrapbooking, and you can make it as easy or as hard as you want. Uh, you can do things on the computer, you can just add paper, you can stamp it, you can add an embellishment. You know somebody that you haven't seen in a long time, send them a card. Wish them happy birthday. If you talk to anyone that does scrapbooking or card making, they'll say the same thing, that uh, we get together, we have a lot of fun, and we exchange ideas. So. Uh, like I didn't have enough of some product and somebody over there lent me some foam and somebody else will look at something and say, oh, I can do that. I make various kinds of lace, the kind that uh, lends itself to cards and bookmarks and I use it for my little sunbonnet girls on my cards. Got my adhesives in here. I've got scissors that snap. I've got fancy scissors. They make different edges on them. I work with ribbons. I work with um, punches, paper shapers. We shape the paper to what we want them to use. The fun thing about this and the ladies who got this together is uh, the camaraderie. Everyone's very friendly and um, the ideas you get from other people. and. Look at the things people have volunteered to give to us to donate. Uh, for instance, this box is full of wonderful things that probably took someone a long time to um, collect, and we get the privilege of trying it out and using it ourselves. I never did the scrapbooking or anything when I was young, and now I'm finding all this creativeness coming out in doing the storytelling as well. The first time is the hardest, and then I find the more I do, the more. I get into it, I'm addicted to it. And I find that when, like when I leave here, I'll go home after five hours here, I'll go home just more. It's all different types and we share ideas and I think that's what makes it so much fun. It's better to look at this and I'll never drag out all the pictures in the, in the boxes. That's not important. Important is to get it in one place. We would like to invite anyone who might have an interest, come by and see us. You don't have to bring anything if you just want to check us out. And uh, it's Wednesdays, it starts at 9.15, we're here until 2. You can bring your lunch, you can go for lunch and come back, you can come and go whenever you want, no cost. And we have a lot of supplies that we share. If you really want to do it, bring some pictures and a pair of scissors, check us out, and then you can buy the items. And you can do it cheaply or expensively. If you have any interest whatsoever in any of these things, you are most welcome because we're all willing to help and share. Jerry Palmquist of Coquina preaches at the Village Church and also at a local Chinese church. I was always interested in becoming a pastor. In fact, I had hoped my dad would be, but he was a faithful layman in the Alliance Church in Detroit. And so I wanted to be either a missionary or a pastor. I went to Nyack College and uh, prepared. It was the Missionary Training Institute back then, so it was a Bible school, and that's where I prepared for the ministry. When I finished, I went out and started a church in Winthrop, Maine. Go up there and find a job and an apartment to live in, and there's two families to begin working with, and that's the way it started. And there's a building there. They've just celebrated their 50th anniversary. Your greatest fear when you get out of the ministry is your first funeral. And I was in the pastorate for about three months and there was a terrible fire up there and we lost seven people in that fire. So my first funeral I had seven people in it, a mother and six children. So that was quite a, an experience. I was about 20, 22 years old, yeah. You look back on that and you wonder, how did we do those things? But the Lord was good to us. And then I moved down to Greenfield, Massachusetts. And I pastored there for 20 years. So I've only had three churches. I went to, uh, I finished my ministry after 37 years in New England. I went to uh, uh, Watertown, Wisconsin, pastored there for 10 years before I retired and came down to Shell Point. Well, it's very interesting. When I moved to Shell Point, there were a lot of people here, a lot of pastors retired, who I had actually gone to college with. And so all these years, 
uh, we've known each other. Um, I worked in the district office for 10 years and my superintendent was Neil Clark, he lives next door. <laughs> a year after I was here, I had an opportunity to go to the Chinese church, the Alliance Church in uh, Naples, once a month and we meet with the people and I, I bring a message through an interpreter. You only have half the time to present a message, which would be about 15 minutes. And we get used to using the same interpreter. There's a, a young family that comes to the church and uh, she does the interpreting for me every month. Been down to a baptismal service on Naples Beach and there were 11 people baptized one day. And uh, they have become very good friends of ours. Uh, one of the reasons I got started was we had been with uh, the Alliance and Pastoral Care for our missionaries in Brazil and Argentina for 17 years. And when I would go down there, I would speak through an interpreter. So they knew that I had done that kind of ministry. But that's been a real blessing to be able to do that these past four years. There's a, a lot of people that I still do keep contact with. In fact, this summer in our travels, we visited some of those parishioners. And it's been a real blessing to be able to share with them and see how they've grown and how their children have followed the Lord. It's a very rewarding thing to, to meet those people today. As long as the Lord gives us the ability and uh, the openings to serve Him, that's the important thing for us. And I think it's a real blessing to be able to serve not only outside like at Naples, but right here in the Village Church. There are so many different gifts that different people have. And as long as the Lord's given us those gifts, we need to use them as long as we're able. And I think that's really important. And it, uh, in our re years of retirement, we realize that there's a purpose in uh, so many of these things for us to fulfill. So I find it a real blessing to be able to serve the Lord in so many different capacities. Harry Pyle is an unlikely pastor who has a heart for the rural communities of America. I had some other things on my mind. I want to be a big league ball player. And so I focused on that in my high school years and uh, went to try out with Philadelphia Phillies. And two weeks before I did that, I broke my finger. And I went ahead and tried, and I thought I was doing pretty good, but they didn't think so. Then uh, they said, come back. So in the meantime, I was working at a shoe factory and I was cutting top lifts and I happened to miss and cut off the end of my thumb on the same hand. So that eliminated uh, the uh, baseball part of it. I was so low after not being able to play ball and I began to feel uh, other problems, spiritual problems. And uh, I was in much agony and uh, I looked up one time and here came a girl they brought in to work and uh, just clicked. I looked at her and she was the most beautiful lady I'd ever seen, still is. But at that time, I saw something different in her. There was something special. She was, had a radiant atmosphere to her. And I found out, the first thing she asked me when we were dating was go to church with her. So we went to church and uh, I had in my head that if I was a pretty good boy and I hadn't done too many bad things, hadn't killed anybody, and so I thought I was doing pretty good. And so uh, I felt like, you know, if you live good enough, you, you know, you, you had good deeds that way, your bad deeds, you go to heaven. So I argued with their preacher because he was preaching that I was a sinner and and I didn't want to, you know, I didn't like that too well. And suddenly, during the preaching of the Word of God, I realized that I was a sinner and it scared me to death. I mean, I knew that God wouldn't save me because I was so bad. And so at that time, why well, I heard the story of Christ and how He died for our sin and was buried and rose again. And uh, I came to know that I was a sinner. I acknowledged my sins, repented, and I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. 
So I was enjoying that atmosphere, going to church, singing hymns and songs and all those things. I was enjoying it. And one day I suddenly thought, you know, I need to be doing more than this to show my appreciation to God. And I began to be concerned, but I would write scriptures down, take it into work, thinking it was a, you know, a little sermon. And I thought, well, everybody, you know, they'll just go wild. They did go wild, but the other way, they didn't want anything to do with that. And so uh, that led me into the desire to preach the Word of God. And so I announced my call to preach in 19... Uh, 50 and uh, I went to school for four and a half years at Lexington Baptist College and during that time they, they sent us out to do mission work in the hills of Kentucky and out of the way places and I, when I went to those places I saw the people had, didn't have big buildings, they didn't have all the niceties of life, and they didn't have, some of them didn't have electric, electricity when I went there. And, uh, but anyway, one day I went to do a mission point up in the mountains, and it was so terribly cold that day, and my car wouldn't start, and I had to have the fellas give me a push and get me started. And then they didn't have super highways either. So I finally got to the mission point, and came church time, and nobody was there but five young people. Just five. I said, where's your mommies and daddies? And they said, well, they don't, they don't come. And I thought, just in a second, I thought, you mean I've froze to death and dr driven up here, and, and there nobody here but five children, and God rebuked me. And so I sang, we sang little uh, songs together, and I talked to them about Jesus. And it was a happy, one of the happiest times in my life. God really blessed me. And there is where I began to be concerned about uh, country people. Of course, I'm a hillbilly. And I was raised that way. And I saw that need. I still see that need today. I remember my dad was drinking on that Sunday morning. And I was really down about it. And, so that afternoon at home, he was sitting reading the paper and I was talking to my sister about the things of God and didn't even know he was even paying any attention. And so he worked out of town. He always left Sunday afternoon, he didn't leave. And so I said, you know, uh, something about it. And he said, I'm gonna stay and listen to you preach tonight. And so uh, that night I preached and after I, we closed, or we sang a hymn, and I asked a man an uh, invitation, asked a man to dismiss in prayer while he's praying. My dad said, wait a minute. And so in God's mercy, God saved him that night. And so I, I thought about, you know, the providence of God and how he deals with, with the ministry and, and the things he brings into your life. And, the fact that I met Dolores was just overwhelming to me because I didn't plan that. I wasn't interested in girls. I still was upset about not playing ball. But anyway, that's the way God worked it out. And so I pastored then. I went to uh, Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church on the Ohio River across from Huntington, West Virginia. Was there 18 and a half years. And the Lord blessed us. and. Dolores' mom moved to Florida in 1965. We started coming down here. That's when it was a wilderness. <laughs> and I met the pastor of the Naples Park Baptist Church. The pastor at Naples Park was resigning down here at the same time. I didn't know it. He didn't know I was either. So he called me and said, would you be interested in coming to Florida and priest? And I said, oh, me. God impressed me to come to Florida, and I'm thankful he did. And we've been here and, and I've preached 33 years at, down at Naples Park and we've had uh, ups and downs but we need young preachers that'll get out in places where it's difficult to get to and you don't have very many people and it's tough and they can't support you except maybe food and things like that. I'm glad we stayed because Sunday morning real early I was down at church and a man came by in desperate need spiritually 
And I thought if we'd closed the doors here, I wouldn't have this opportunity and he wouldn't have. So God impressed me with the fact that, that I want to be where he wants me to be. Doesn't matter where it is. He gives you what you need when you need it. And you never know where God's blessings are coming from. I was at that funeral and a fellow came up to me and he said, you remember me? And I said, well, not really. He said, I was in one of your Bible schools and said, the Lord saved me and uh, he wanted me to know about it. So you never know. Uh, and that's, that's really the way it works. We've had people down at church that have come into the church that were really in tremendous needs spiritually and been in a lot of bad situations and God saved them and they've been some of the best members that you could have. So you never know. We're glad you joined us for today's show. Tune in next week for more stories and news from around your community. Until then, this is Shell Point Today for the weekend of December 6th, 7th, and 8th. I'm Jared Pike, and from all of us here at Shell Point TV, we hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you again on Monday.